Kia teite rangi e te rangi maori e hi kote atua nā nā nei nā, nā mia kato. Peace to everybody. And God creates all things. The work itself is a combination of works which were paralleled to going back into our roots into the Tuwhari Tō side and especially into the Ngāti Hutu side too. The other piece is a um, rather large tiki style which associates itself with Bess or how history-wise base that goes back genetically, DNA-wise, back into the border between Persia at the days gone by and India, which I used a lot of that form of the tiki form to associate with the word best was in recognition of a slight character. It used to be a protector of the woman and children, particularly when people came onto the marae, he would do a dance or a type of form, I suppose you could say haka, that would represent his position of authority by speaking and saying he was there to protect the children and the woman. I've had a long interest in identity and particularly what it is to be a New Zealander. I wanted to develop a different language to understand who I was. So in the background of these paintings, there's what might look initially to be like a Māori pattern, but it's actually a combination of English symbology and Māori, so it, it's become a new thing. And then the figures are overlaid over the top of that as a way of symbolising the, the sort of essence of who they are, so the spiritual side. And the pattern is the same behind the self-portrait and the portrait of my great-grandmother. And when it comes to my own identity, I get to choose that. That's not something that should be imposed on me. Yeah, so artworks are an amazing way of exploring really difficult topics. Gently, one at a time, you know, one little aspect at a time. Uh, kia ora, whanakau te maunga, ke rui te awa, te marae, whanau a kai aio, um, te whanau apu nui, uh, te iwi, uh, ko Gary Whiting tōku ingo. This is part of an ongoing theme, um, it's part of a, a Masters that I did a few years ago. I started exploring fibre as a part of my work. Uh, what I'm interested in is time-based work, which is video-based work and it's very much um, looking at materials, the materiality of things in a different sort of way over time and movement. Part of my practice has actually been getting used to using um, sliders and so that you can control the way movement happens and you can control time in that sort of way across um, you know, different types of surfaces and objects. A lot of what I do is very dependent on when you're looking at working in the environment particularly um, you can't control it, uh, and so for my master's work I probably spent about two years visiting the Saddle Road, for example, <laughs> and just waiting for the right conditions. The title of the exhibition, which is uh, Falling Star, Catch a Falling Star, um, what I have looked at and what I'm looking at is using a kete as a metaphor. It's used to carry things, and some might even say for catching things. And so because it is time-based, uh, and there is definitely a photographic quality, light is important, and so I'm playing around with that sort of idea. I was really looking at the yin-yang, uh, the positive-negative, uh, every rose have a thorn sort of thing. So I've centred the work around that, but in a sort of kind of humorous style which I sort of call or refer to as humanity, humanity sort of being uh, the humour back into humanity with these pieces that are looking at uh, the positive and the negative and somewhere in between but playing with it within a very graphic painterly type style. 
quite childlike in its sense from bright colours rather than uh, very neutral tones just to really make a kabam sort of viewpoint. Sort of a bit like the shirt. <laughs> so it's definitely non-digital but it will have a digital overlay using uh, AR which is augmented reality. So it's with a device that the user might bring they can scan a QR code and that's going to take them into a different realm playing with the images and, and just revealing a little bit more than what might be on the surface. All the things I've learnt I want to bring together from the most recent stuff to the first things I've learnt. So it's, it's a whole lifetime of coming together in this one output. The theme is the spiritual 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 一つ目は仏教がインドで、インドで発祥された初期に作成されたと言われる六道輪廻図を写真のコラージュで制作しました。長い歴史の中で多くの人が様々な表現でその像の腰ており、私はそのテンプレートに従って自分の個性とこだわ
present and future because you know we're the ancestors of the future so I need to be honouring the past and my present so I can be a good ancestor in the future, hopefully. My general process is to really just get me out of the way and contemplation and play and then things just uh, evolve from there. I started off with uku, with clay, and ended up doing this. <laughs> My mind just went ping and changed to harakeke. And that just flowed and I just knew straight away as soon as it started evolving, I just went, that's it. <laughs> I don't have anything limiting my mind to say, oh, you can't do this, or you can't do that, you should do this, you shouldn't do that. There's none of that. I'm out of the way. And my hands are just building something. And I put them down straight, flat, they're all in a line. Mm, this, ain't, this ain't it, I don't know what it is. And so I just started moving them until we got this shape. And I thought, ah, now that's, that's something, because you can feel it and you can see it. So I am still following the tradition of you know, dying harakeke and the poor kinikini strands that I'm using, that is traditional and yes, I, that is a form of regurgitation. However, <laughs> I am using it in a way that's not usual. So I like that part of it that I am trying to create something new and not, you know, be completely traditional and following the other footsteps. What can be the hard part is listening to kōrero from all over the place that says it should look like this, it should be like this, you know, the, the, the technique is this and that and the rest, but that doesn't allow for actual creativity, creating something, um, I don't know, pioneering or, or new. Going back seven generations, a Swedish man who set sail somehow and ended up in the dead centre of Ireland and then migrated via England out to New Zealand. Further delving into my ancestry, I discovered 11 generations ago originated in Prussia during the 30-year war and they by way of ship also migrated south via Australia, eventually landing in New Zealand. With them all migrating, the one thing in common was they all came by boat. Everyone had to come by boat back in the day. Every boat has an anchor. Every boat needs to anchor. And that anchor is something that everyone is familiar with, the symbol of the anchor the concept of a safe harbour, the concept of hope. I work as a mixed media, multimedia artist. In my day job I'm making clothes, so I have a lot of fabrics and sometimes the fabric overflows into my artwork. I love the tactile nature of fabric and yeah, I like producing things that you can touch. You don't have to feel fearful of touching, even though it's not the norm in a gallery. Whatever I do, I just choose whatever material, medium I want to use that best represents what I'm trying to portray. And yeah, so I've kind of been delving into the tactile nature of using things that bring out feelings um, through touch. look at this piece. I haven't quite finished it yet, but uh, this one here is about uh, oh, one of the old classic Māori myths. This is the separation of Rangi and Papa. So we've got Papa Tuanuku here, we have the Rangi Nui, and then we have Tane in the middle. And you can see he's kind of he's hugging, but he's pushing his mum, but he's separating his mother and his father. And it's all from darkness to light. Um, so yeah, one of my goals has been trying to tell uh, complex stories simply. So when you look at it, you can kind of go, you'll see there's darkness here, the black dots flow, 
Um, and, is, and then the flow just kind of represents kind of life, how, how things aren't, things don't go in a straight line. <laughs> they will for a while, but then everything kind of cares, but it's also what's beautiful to the eye. And what's beautiful to the eye is actually uh, flow. People like seeing flow. I have a general idea, this kind of pattern, this, this look good to me, and then I'll just work it away until it actually, until I like it. Um, and then hopefully tell a story within it. Where on this side, it's more simpler. But again, it's try trying to explain a really complex thing. So in, in Māori tanga, there's this thing called a wairu a tapu. Um, and it talks about the two waters. And it's, it's really similar across all cultures, actually. Uh, Hindu and Muslims and even Christianity, they kind of talk about how water is as kind of a... They express as part of spirituality, but also how we have natural water, but we get also other water that has spiritual water. In Māori, the kind of wairu a tapu, how there's water from the heavens and there's waters from the... from Papa, from, 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 from our father and from our mother. And these two things together make, make what we call the real water. And you can't one without the other. Uh, but again, it's supposed to represent the flow. Uh, the the Kakao Roa is mostly about cultural mis misunderstandings, but also about cultural cultures coming together as well. I chose the Axe Head as a contemporary piece because it came along later in the history uh, with Pākehā and the introduction of the steel. And then because I'm a glass artist, I thought I'd make it in glass. I actually had the metal axe head. I could have used that, but I didn't want to use it. I wanted to cast to show my other talents in this field of sculpture. When you do lost wax technique, you use a lot of wax. Uh, and I was so used to making everything beautiful and smooth because glass, wanted it nice and polished and all that. And as soon as I got into Fakare, the surface designs, uh, then I knew I could, I could just see myself carving wax and being able to cast that into lots of amazing things. The Hoi is a major piece. Uh, it's all about the uh, whakapapa of Whakaro. It's an amazing story about uh, Ruta Pupuki going down to the ocean and trying to rescue his son from Tangaroa and, uh, and then stealing some carvings and bringing them up to the surface of the ocean and that's when mankind got carving. I definitely am going to be sticking with glass and wood because I just love those two mediums anyway. I'll probably even get into a bit of raranga or muka because uh, if I make any mauraku, any weaponry, I'll be using that to do the bindings and things. One of the things that I really like to work with creatively is layering, layering of the material, layering of concept, layering of meaning. So I'm quite fond of layers. I saw a video of Cliff talking about the importance of Papatua Nuku as a unifier and yeah, so I was just thinking about layers of the land and creation and growth. I love analog work and I, will st I still do it when I can. Because they trained us so well, you know, because we, we learned to shoot manual, we had to shoot with analog cameras. I got my digital camera and I still, to this day, shoot on manual and it was an okay transition. I, it, I think it opened up possibilities rather than limitations. In my digital work, I will go to Photoshop and sort of tinker with things and I will bring in scans of my analog work so I can't let it, I can't let it go. <laughs> so I often weave the analog and the digital together and the more creative stuff, you know, the more sort of abstracted stuff that I do and go through cycles of it, scan it, redo it, scan it, redo it. But you never forget the analog way of working where you're really looking at light and then how's it going to translate. We emigrated to New Zealand in 2010 and so I looked into the theme of liminality which is where I think all migrants find themselves. It's on that in-between space where you're neither here nor there, you've got a foot in each country and that in-between space causes um, a lot of 
confusion, it's ambiguous. If you're flying somewhere, you're completely in that in-between space. So traveling often is also seen as a transformational or a transitional, that in-between um, act almost. So I'm trying to show through my work that ambiguity. So I make um, these sculpture 3D artworks and I'm trying to reuse and recycle everything. So basically everything that's in that in the big one is either um, from op shops, the clothes that's in there, or it's just cardboard that I got that was thrown out. If someone throws something out, it's not in the previous state anymore and so if you pick it up and you transform it into something else, it, it goes through that transformation and gets a new lease of life. Ko Aotea Te Waka, ko Taranaki Te Maunga, ko Maha Oku i Honunga, ki ngā iwi e karapoti ana i Te Maunga, i ngā rino te tonga o Taranaki a hau. Sequoia, old decking timber, and it was all stained and oiled and everything, so I just took that layer off. Shaved the outer layer off and the colours were just pretty striking, I, I kind of thought, cool. There's some light ones and there's some dark ones. Oh, I know what, you know. Huia <laughs> feathers like black and white. Or dark blue and white, whatever, and let's try that. Majority of rangatira of hapu had huia feather showing just to show people their rank in, in their hapu or their iwi. Got the light light bits of wood up the top and the darker bits more down down the bottom. I have to pre-drill because that sequoia is really sensitive and if you knock a, knock a nail in or straight screw a screw in without a pre-drilled hole it just splits the wood really easily. The main reason why they went extinct was because of the fashion industry. People deciding, Europeans deciding overseas that it was fashionable to have one of these feathers. Yeah, so they come over, shot, killed, gone. I painted wood carvings. And I, there's probably very few people actually do what I'm doing because that took me months just to do that. It's not something you do on a weekend. Everything's inspired by nature. I don't draw or paint or carve people. Lots of other people like prefer that sort of thing. Well, I prefer to be inspired by nature. I was voluntary gardening in Coromandel uh, 20 years ago, and I woke up one day and I thought, I actually don't want to do this anymore. I can live in paradise forever and eat awesome food and be around really nice people. And I did enjoy living there, but I thought there was something else I wanted to do, I didn't know what it was. It wasn't until that day that I left there that I discovered what it was. I left there, I went to Rotorua to watch some guys do some wood carving. I just thought, oh, we'll go and see what these guys are doing. And, and the elderly Mary fellow says to me, oh, have you ever done any carving? I said, no. I said, I'll just come in and watch, is that alright? He said, yeah. So I watched them for about an hour and a half. He said, do you want to give it a go? I said, I'm right. <laughs> okay, why not? So he drew a pattern on a piece of wood about half the size of the tabletop gave me a wooden mallet and a, a chisel and said carpet. So I was like, oh, so I did. And after about an hour, maybe a little bit longer, he said, how do you do that? And I said, well, I'll watch you for an hour and a half. He said, well, I, I spend months trying to teach my students what you've just done in an hour and a half. He said, you've got an actual talent to do this. This is what you're here to do, don't put the tools down. I said, all right then. And so I really enjoy doing it and I don't have to think about doing it. And um, it just sort of natural thing comes to me. I've got um, comment sheets from various exhibitions and people from all around the world have really given really good feedback. They love what I do and say, keep on doing it. So I do. <laughs> I like lots of colour in, in case you, you know, <laughs> noticed. <laughs> Thank you.
fascinated with photography. I was developing my own films in the bathroom at home over 70 years ago. <laughs> I used to have a, a Mamaya RB67, which was, you know, a 6x7, good size. And I used to have it on a tripod over my shoulder everywhere I went. And it was, um, loved it, and I had three backs for it. And if I got excited about a scene, I'd, I'd sometimes use the three backs, one black and white, one colour negative, and one transparency. And I'll be gibbering away. I hope the scene doesn't go away or change or whatever, you know, as anxious to capture it in as many formats as possible. I'm a fan of black and white. I find it more dramatic. And today, everything's colour. And it's, it's just overwhelming in some cases. And I like to kind of go back to basic black and white, you know, relying on the colour to make the image. The image I like to have as a statement in its own right. 